With the polar bear cover, and there's a lot of additional examples, it seems like in the last 18 months, we've seen a lot more of this sky is falling type news coverage. Is it because there has been, whatever the anomaly is, more examples, or is it just that it's a more popular story than it was five years ago? Well, the Arctic is far warmer than it was five or 10 years ago. No question about that. It, there, you know, let's just focus on that for okay. a minute. I, you know, I, I was at the North Pole in 2003 and standing on the sea ice with scientists studying all these changes. And even in 2003, it was still more nuanced than it is now. There's definitely a trend toward much more open water in the summers. And that's hard for polar bears. Definitely polar bears, they really like sea ice. They really don't like open water. They, some will drown all the time if they have to swim too far, but they can swim 100 miles, so they're not exactly uh, uncomfortable in that environment. They won't have a happy time in a warmer world, but they're not going away either. But, but our tendency in the media, of course, is to sort of compress toward that front page thought. Yeah. It's much more powerful to talk about the vanishing polar bear than to say they're going to have a hard time, they're not going extinct. That's not a front page thought. Well, yeah, and it's harder to have a nuanced, less alarmist view and get people's attention by definition. Yeah, and I just blogged on this this past week. There are some very um, hot-button characters, Newt Gingrich, mm. Bjorn Lomborg, who've come out and said climate really is a problem. It's just not that problem. It's not a crisis. It's something we can manage. We need to have aggressive push on technology. But they're, they're very contentious characters. Uh, uh, and that they've grabbed that middle, maybe sensing that both the, the right wing, which is trying to deny the whole thing, and the more left wing, which is saying it's a catastrophe now, and that's why you, act, you need to act, um, that both of those have flaws. Boy, is there, there's so much low-hanging fruit. I, I blogged the other day about a study that just came out um, from the, the Bush administration um, saying that uh, American buildings, just the structures, the houses and offices in our country, emit more greenhouse gases, more carbon dioxide than every other country, their total emissions, except for China. This was the Clinton-Bloomberg issue, right? Didn't they have a press conference oh, like yes. a month or two? Yeah. I think you covered it, right? Yeah, I did write about yeah. that, yeah. And I interviewed Bill Clinton at the time That's uh, right, yeah. for, for our, our site. And, and he's kind of drunk the Kool-Aid. You know, I, I asked him... Um, I'd asked him this question two years ago, and he said the same thing, and, but it, didn't, it wasn't on the record at the time. So I asked him again, and it's a video interview on our website. Um, I said, if, if all, if all ex-presidents could only work on one issue, you know, because he's all over the map, you know, yeah. poverty and AIDS, yeah. I said, what would yours be? And he did that great, you know, kind of bit his lip and, <laughs> and pondered for a second, and then he said, energy. So where are you on the um, optimist-pessimist continuum? Are you like my great-grandchildren are going to not recognize the world I live in? <laughs> um, I have a di diurnal cycle. I start out the day optimistic most of the time. I go to bed pessimistic after a day of doing my work. <laughs> but I usually wake up optimistic again. Uh, people are the most resilient species imaginable. And we have been able to use our innovative quality to get more out of less resources to once we have the wealth to, to do a great job of improving our environment. The Hudson Valley here where I live is a great example. The river was a sewer 30 years ago. It's, you can swim in it now, which I do sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's part of our nature. Um, we're a fix-it species. Uh, we tend to be a crisis response species, like my son still tends to leave his homework till the very last moment at midnight yeah. the night before. And there was a time when I did that too. And, and one thing I did say in the blog somewhere is uh, in the introductory part is, we're just, it's like, almost like we're sort of like my teenage son. We're, we're just in our, poised to come out of our adolescence as a species. Our sort of muscle flexing, cow tipping. Wow, look what I can do, Ma. Not Ma, you wouldn't want your Ma to know. You, look what I can do kind of moment. Um, take down a forest, burn a fuel, fish out an ocean. To a more uh, reasoned, adult, grown-up view. Now, how can I plan ahead, you know, well, I got to save for college for my kids, you know, what those are hard things for us to do. And, and those same kinds of questions like saving for college or what's up with social security are, are like the kinds of environmental problems that we face too. Climate is more like the social security problem than like pollution. So I'm going to close by trying one last time to pin a couple specific sure, things that we can think of. Is it a carbon tax? Is it oh, oh, 60 point. miles per gallon cars? Like what? What would make the most difference? 
it's two things. It's, it's a, an aggressive push to refine and conceive of new energy options. I mean, to refine the existing ones mm -hmm. and find new ones that really work that on a large scale that are cheap. And having a disincentive, a stick, for dumping gases into the atmosphere that have pose a long-term risk. So it's really both, those two things. It's hard to find anyone who thinks we'll have a significant shift in our energy patterns without a cost on these costly emissions. Yeah. And at the same time, though, you will not solve this problem with just that because the kinds of advances that are required to, to empower 9 billion people to the level of prosperity that everyone seems to naturally aspire to can't come from existing technologies. So it's not about getting 60 miles a gallon, it's about not having gas in the tank to begin with. That, well, it, it's both because we need more efficiency now to slow the rate of emissions growth. Okay. So yeah, having double efficiency is great, but that's sort of just setting the table for the big dinner that has to come. Yeah. And we haven't gone shopping yet. Yeah, and are, are we going shopping? No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, we've written the Energy Challenge series that I worked on a lot with other reporters here shows that we're, we've actually un disinvested in research on energy. Why? For, Who's to blame? Well, prices, for, you know, oil went back to like $20 a barrel. It, there was the spike in the 70s, so right. we all thought about energy, yeah. and then it went away. Um, this is Newt Gingrich's point as well, that in real dollars, gas is still cheaper than it was yeah. back in the 70s. Yeah, and, um, and the political imperative has always been there based on the cost of energy. And coal, uh, electricity is still really cheap. We had, you can, in the Midwest, it's five cents a kilowatt hour. Here in New York area, it's like 14 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, my, my electric bill is like $60 a month in the Hudson Valley and you know it's not something I think about it's not uh, change and, your and unless that long-term environmental cost meaning future costs to the climate system is somehow integrated into my the way I think about energy now then I'm not probably going to change rapidly is there a consensus on whether clean coal is actually clean or not well if you put climate emissions in the definition of clean that's a totally different question than Clean coal can be pretty clean. You know, if you burn it the right way, you raise the efficiency of a plant, there's still stuff that comes out of particulates, soot, that can kill people. And in fact, there's an estimate for how many people die every year from coal emissions, even with our cleaner plants. And reports but of asthma you, near the plants. Yeah, but all that stuff is not based on the CO2, the carbon dioxide. That's the whole separate question. Right. You know, getting that stuff is a, is a harder thing to do than capturing the old-fashioned pollution. So actually, I may just not fully understand clean coal. Is that separate from them when they put it back into the ground? That's ca yeah, it's carbon capture. Here, all these wonderful terms. Carbon capture and sequestration is what they call that, which is can you burn your coal and eat it too, sort of. You know, can, you, can you get all those BTUs out of the coal and capture the gas and compress it and stick it in a hole and keep it there in perpetuity? And that, is, that falls into that category of maybe things that we don't really know because we're hardly even touching that as a research question. Uh, there's one or two projects around the world that are looking at it. And, and MIT came out with a study recently that says we need five or ten times as many of those projects now in order to know 10 or 15 years from now if this is something that will help us fight the climate challenge. Yeah. So I'm having trouble figuring out if you wake up optimistic for some substantive reason or because you had a good night's sleep? <laughs> oh, God. Um, it's probably more a frame of mind than based on rea the facts. The facts are that we face a big challenge here. And the facts are that everything about our species, and politics is just a reflection of human nature, yeah. makes this a bad fit. It's not going to be easy for us to do this, just like it's still not easy for my son to figure out how to write a paper on, you know, parse out the work. And it's just like it's not easy to reach for an apple instead of a cookie, you know, when you know theoretically the apple is better for you. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, my optimism is not based on, on the data. 